Welcome back to another episode of Wandering Infilly, the show. This one's interesting for a couple different reasons. Number one, we actually had not recorded a new episode of the show for almost two months, and you will hear all about why that has taken so long. Yep. So in this episode, we talk about kind of what we've been up to the past two months, um, some hard stuff that we both as a couple have been dealing with um, related to anxiety. And I mean, let's be honest, though, like, I've had to deal with it, but like you've taken the yeah. But I think as you'll listen, as you'll listen, as you'll hear, it's you know something that we have to take on as a couple together as well. And I just, it was important to us to share that experience with you guys and not just show you the pretend like everything's okay, but to take you along with us um, during the real stuff that happens in our lives. So. Uh, if you're somebody who deals with anxiety or you have a loved one that deals with anxiety, we really hope this episode is helpful. We hope that it makes you feel not alone in those feelings, and we hope you enjoy it. And it's longer, and it may not be as silly and fun, but uh, but it still it's, is a little bit real, silly real. and fun. It's the real, real. Hey there, we're Jason and Caroline Zook, a husband and wife team who believes life is just one big experiment. This is the show where we share our journey as we figure out this ever-changing thing called life. We cover topics like running a business, traveling the world, and clawing our way out of debt, all with the hope of inspiring you to live, work, and create with more intention. Life might bring its twists and turns, but when you know who you are and what you want, you're never really lost. Welcome to Wandering Aimfully, the show. In the Crisp cold spin drift line. Oh, you do have like a little guy right on the right. I can't do it. I don't have nails. Right side of the big tooth. No, right side, big tooth. You know how we've talked about this? Right side. Yeah. Okay. You got it. Right side. You're there. We need to talk about this. Yeah. When you show somebody what's in their teeth, do it mirror image. I don't know how to do that. So just tell you right side. This is the fun part about doing this is that we're going to. you get it? Yeah, you got it. Are you sure? Perfect. Yeah. Guys, I had a kind bar right before Mm. we pressed record. Do we didn't cheers. Um, So our podcast. Tell the good people at home why we have show. Is not sponsored by Spindrift yet. I don't know. Maybe we'll work on them. But they did, however, because we're social media influencers who are not on social media as of recording, which is kind of funny, uh, send us lime, their brand new flavor. And so we are not. And boy, is it delightful. Shamelessly drinking it. It tastes like summer. It does taste like summer. We were talking to our friend Jen, who's downstairs because we're in the Watch Pod and we're at their house and we record here and about how coconut LaCroix used to be like, oh, that tasted like summer. Now it just tastes like sunscreen and we don't drink LaCroix. So we yeah. drink Spindrift. And uh, this has two full limes squeezed into it. Do you know what I just realized? What did you, le- you realize? We're not doing a great job of like trying to get them on the hook to sponsor us because we're giving them like free sponsorship. Dang it. Dang it. We're not I wish good. I, knew, I wish I knew anything we're about not good sponsorships. good at the influencer stuff. Wish I knew anything about sponsorships. Uh, <laughs> setting the timer because, you know, we haven't been in here in a few weeks. Tell the people how many weeks. I believe it's been seven or eight weeks since we've actually sat down and recorded. Now, for you guys watching, you're like... Pfft. You've showed up every week on YouTube and in my podcast app. And that's called the magic of the internet. It's called the magic of batching and getting ahead of your schedule. We're going to get to the big topic of today. Okay. But first, I want to bring up something that I think is fun that you didn't know that I realized this morning while in the shower. This is episode 26. So we've been doing this for half a year, essentially, worth of episodes. Isn't that kind of crazy? Six months of weekly episodes. That's crazy. 26. There's 52 weeks in a year. That's hard to believe. 26 is half. Math. Our very first episode was about. You mean, well, we launched three on the very I first know, one. but like our the very number one. Our very first was our origin story. Mental health episode. That was number three. I know, but it was like the first like real episode. Like the first. Okay, like, well, you should have specified your question. All right. But you know what I mean? Yeah. Which I think is interesting. Six months later, half a year later, we got a curveball. <laughs> which is interesting because I remember recording that episode and. A lot of you guys told us that you really enjoyed that episode and you were glad that we were talking about something like mental health. But, you know, I look back now and I think to myself, I feel like in that episode, I was a little bit like prescriptive from the perspective of because I wasn't really struggling that hard with anxiety at the time. Mm -hmm. So it was sort of like, here's my anxiety journey. And this is something that is a part of who I am. And here's how I've dealt with it. And and like thumbs up. And this episode is a little different because. We're in the thick of it. We're in the midst of what I call an anxiety spell, just because I don't know how else to describe it. But like, not very different from a Harry Potter spell. anxiety spell. Expecto Patronum is that one of them? 
That well, you're good. asking me, and I've never seen or read any of the you things. You watched the first movie with me. Yeah, I did. We were on a good tear for a little while. I thought we were going to watch all so of them, and then we just stopped. look at this lies that you're just telling everyone. Lies he didn't do Manelli. any spells. It was, all we did was backstory in the first one. Ugh. Yeah. All the Harry Potter fans were like, no, he did spells. He did spells. I'll Shut tell up. You, I'll tell you the spells. JK, would, she would hate you right now. Anyway. All right. JK, JK, get it? Oh, so the where we want to go with this episode is to really, I think, peel back the curtain on what you've been dealing with the past couple months, what we've both been dealing with, because I think it's fair to say that if you have a partner or a very close friend or anybody in your life, part of your family who has gone through something like this, it is. It affects both people in the relationship, and it's tough on both. Yeah. It's obviously tougher for you because no. you're dealing with the thing, but it is tough for both people. It's 100% tough for both. and I mean, it's tougher for me, obviously. Going back to what I was saying before, that's kind of – it was really important to me to do this episode where it's not perfectly tied up with a bow, and I don't have all the answers, but because I wanted to give somebody who is in the thick of it – an opportunity to watch or listen to something and go, oh, like, I'm not alone in this feeling that I'm having right now. Because I know, you know, a couple of weeks ago when I was, like, really in the thick of it, that is what I most needed was just to be like, this isn't... You're not dying. I'm not dying. Right. Which is, like, a very real thought that you have. Right. Um, You know, and I just wanted somebody... I wanted validation of, like... I'm not alone in feeling all these things. Right. All right. So let's take people back. Let's, okay. Let's scroll back the time. So the kind of where I think this came back around for you mm-hmm. was Christmas Day was really where this started. Well, it's interesting because I, I wouldn't say that. Really? I mean. I think that was like the first like, whoop, uh-oh. Something like. Well, then if you want to like, this is what's interesting about it is if you really want to go that way, then you could say, oh, when I got back from Toronto, like remember, right. and we were all to dinner with Jen and Caleb. So, all right. So here's the point. There yeah. have been a lot of different signs. Yeah. Here's yeah. here's what I'll tell you is sort of the build up to what I think the straw that broke the camel's back, which I think was one of our Wagook to be's. Oh, man. And we forgot what that is. I don't remember. Yeah. Um, It's been a heck of a year and a half, basically. So let me just give you the quick rundown. Christmas of 2017, my mom gets diagnosed with breast cancer. She's fine. But all of last year was her surgery and just the emotional weight of like... But she had like three surgeries, right? Yeah. Surgery, yeah. complications with surgeries, the emotional weight of like trying to be present for her and supportive of her and just the uncertainty of what was happening. Meanwhile, we're building Wandering Aimfully. We're combining our businesses. We pushed ourselves probably way too hard in that um, process focusing for long, long periods of time, giving ourselves these deadlines, putting a lot of pressure on ourselves all throughout the summer. We launch it in August. Um, Then my body reacts to that stress on top of itself. I get shingles Mm -hmm. in August and September and a little bit of November. And for those of you who don't know, it's basically the chicken pox virus that you have when you're a kid stays in your system. And when you're under stress or low immune system, it kind of rears its ugly head you get, get a lot of nerve pain. You get a weird rash. It takes a long time to heal. Um, but that is basically a body's reaction to stress. Mm-hmm. So you can tell I'm already like, there's a lot of stress going on. Yeah. Then I have all of this sort of unsettled, not to use trauma in like a big word, but unsettled psychological issues dealing with that because there's a lot of pain associated with that. There's a lot of you're out of the game. I couldn't work. Um, yeah. I mean, there were two months basically when there was one month when you were bedridden. Right. Like we're like you can't move, you're on painkillers. Every day piercing pain behind your right ear. Yeah. And and you had the rash. We could see the shingles rash, but it actually wasn't even affecting you that right. much. It was more the pain. It was more the pain and then the the rash reared its ugly head. Yep. Uh, which and was just gnarly. like nights of not being able to sleep or fall asleep because you're in so much pain and so then I've told you this before but like trying to fall asleep at night now takes on this like psychological residue because I'm picturing of like how many torturous nights I had of trying to fall asleep. All of that's on me. Then before I got shingles, I had these trips planned. So I was supposed to go to Toronto to do this speaking gig. I didn't want to back out. You know, I'd been paid for my travel. So I fly across the country to a different country. Um, You know, I ride a bus before I'm actually healed. I ride a bus three hours to go stay with a bunch of strangers. It was an incredible experience, but that coupled with then speaking so I'm nervous and I'm out of practice because I've literally just been in my bed for you know a long time um and it goes great but I just 
was very anxious, anxious about yeah. it all. I fly back home and immediately right after I was experiencing these very physical symptoms of anxiety, which for me shows up as um, lightheadedness, feeling like I'm about to pass out. And then the racing heart stuff comes after that. But it's very like, I feel like I'm going to pass out. We're out to dinner with friends. I feel like I'm going to pass out. It's scary. Um, but after about a week of kind of like taking a step back, I felt back to my normal self. And when we flew back home to Florida for Christmas, I felt like I was. Well, you, you had a trip to New York in there. I did have a trip to New York in there yeah. that I already planned with my mom to it's, celebrate. being. It's out kind of, of interesting. We've realized now in multiple times when you actually like list all of the things out. It's a lot for anybody, yeah. let alone a highly sensitive person like yourself who all of these things, not to like derail or take away no, from no. the New York trip, but I think the New York trip was like, that was probably the the, the thing that pushed it over yeah. the edge. And it was- and Because it's, New York. and it Right. And New York is a very stressful city for me in general, who is very sensitive to inputs and stimuli and sensory experiences. And that's the ultimate sensory experience. So anyway, I get home, anxiety, yada, yada. But throughout, you know, November and December, I had some time to heal and I was feeling really good. Um, we flew home back to Florida, not where our families are from. We to flew Florida. to Florida. It's really hard to not say I know. flew home. Well, it's always going to be my home, but yeah. back to Florida not for, for me. the holidays. And what Jason was referring to before is we're only there for like five or six days. And so it's a lot of trying to coordinate with all of our families and there's the holidays in there. So it's just stressful. And, you know, one evening we were like playing with our nephews and like it, it was just a lot of like on being on. And then following morning, we go over to your mom's house to have this nice family breakfast that we always Christmas have morning for Christmas morning. And I'm the stockings are hung. <laughs> you know, Santa has been he's arrived. I'm sitting at the table and I feel this. I feel like my ear is on fire. That sounds crazy. But and I can feel it spreading, and this is where I had the shingles. I can feel. If my, you're not watching this, if you're just listening, that it's is just from. She's doing a gentle stroking of the right side of her neck and ear down to her shoulder, and imagine her hair is there and it looks luscious and lovely. Okay. <laughs> and I can just feel it lighting up, and this is where the nerve trail is that was affected by the shingles. And I just stop, like almost mid sentence, and I go to the and I excuse myself from the table, and I go to the bathroom, and I peel back my turtleneck, and it's just lit up. Yeah. It's just. The, the rash, the rash the is red. just yeah. angry. This shingles had happened outbreak. one time before. So I knew, I didn't think it was like, shingles is back. Like, oh crap. I knew that it was temporary because it had happened one time before. Um, So I knew I just needed to calm down and like rest. But it was my body's way of being like, what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> what the fuck are you doing? Yeah. Stop. Yeah. And it's really hard because in that situation, and I think a lot of people who are listening to this that deal with anxiety or just any feelings of overwhelm if you're a highly sensitive person, it's hard to say no to seeing your family at Christmas. You know, like that's not, it's a difficult thing yeah. to deal with. It's okay. No, I know. It's yeah. just, you know. This is a safe space. If you want to cry in the watch pod, <laughs> you cry in the watch pod. Yeah. No, like I remember the reason I'm crying is because I remember the disappointment. Like as I went to like hug your grandparents. Well, and like we had to go back to the hotel. And, and here's the thing. Everyone, as you were leaving, was like, thanks for ruining Christmas. You're an awful person. <laughs> Guys, Seriously. I hope you know by now, if this is the first episode you've ever watched, you're like, oh, wow, this is a really interesting relationship they have. We have the very emotional one. I'm touching Caroline on the shoulder for those of you who are not I watching. I don't even know why I wear glasses. I didn't wear eye makeup. So like, you were like, yeah. it's going to happen. But, um, but no, it, you're you're very emotional and I'm very supportive. I try to be very supportive. Of that I'm a, not emotional at all. Thank but God. I cut through... Difficult with times humor. with humor. So, like, Which when I have stage for. four cancer and I'm about to die, like, you're going to be I'm that guy be in the hospital. Yeah. I know. I'm going to be I'm like, very grateful for that, that nurse has been touching me inappropriately. We always, we, <laughs> we always talk about how if, like, I was married to me, like, I was oh, just, no, 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 no. There's no chance. There's no chance. You, how would both of you get out of bed? We wouldn't. <laughs> you really wouldn't. We would just be. All right. So, that's the full no, recap. No, no, no. I, oh. One more thing I wanted to say before that. Um, I just the point I was trying to make with that is anybody who's been through that, I I can relate to that feeling of disappointment that you can't right. do things that you want to do. Yeah. And you don't know how to say no because sometimes you want to do those things and you don't want to say no. And you're in you're in an opportunity where you only get to see these people once a year or twice a year and you and it's it's embarrassing. Like I it shouldn't be, but like you're embarrassed because you feel like your body's letting you down in a way. You feel like your mind is letting you down in a way. Well, and you see everybody else is perfectly fine. And right. you're like, why can't I just be perfectly 100%, fine? 100%. Why can't I handle this? And there's a lot of like guilt and shame that goes along with that, that I've had to 
to reconcile within myself through this process. And I just didn't want to skate over that because I think that's a very real part of people who struggle with anxiety is then the shame about it yeah. too, which I'm sure I don't, I don't know as much about struggling with something like depression, but I imagine it's perhaps a similar thing where it's just like, you feel like, why can't I be like everybody else? Um, as the, I'm kind of finding myself as like the prosecutor in, in this. Great. Um, where were you on the night of January 4th? What was January I just made oh, it up. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, but so after that, we get we come back home to California. Yes. Um, we kind of get settled. We get back into our routines a little bit. New Year's it's, happens, and I was feeling so good. It's the weird time after Christmas. I think everyone can relate to this. After Christmas, between like the first week of January, when you're kind of like, I don't know what to do with my arms. Like I just, I could do work. I could not do work. I, there's not a lot of stuff going Set on. Some resolutions. Yeah. Change my life. Do I just lose forty pounds today, or how does diet yeah. work? Um, and we were in this space where I think you just started to feel, oh, I have all my time to myself. I can make all my own decisions. Um, going down to my art studio, I'm doing more art. And you got really excited about all the opportunities of the new year. Yeah, and I was feeling so energetic and so good and and honestly just like grateful to feel normal again because the I was finally feeling like healed from the shingles ordeal. Also, a couple of weeks prior, just to throw this in because I think giving all the data points is fun, we had just signed another year lease on our place. That's right. And so literally before Christmas, we signed a lease with with signatures to say we're going to live in our place for another year. So then I'm like, okay, that's off We don't have to think about that. Yeah. That's, you know, we're stressed. We love our place. So then what happened was you and I had this pretty aggressive deadline to complete our program, Build Without Burnout, um, under Wandering Inflate. It was going to be like our cornerstone program. It was a new thing we were building. And it was really to try and niche down like what our Wandering Inflate membership is is for and who it's for. And <clears throat> I have a lot of the front loaded work on that because I love coming up with the curriculum and building the slides and designing it and the look and feel of it. So I'm, if you were following the way uh, Instagram stories at the time, I was documenting the whole experience. I was putting in a lot of focused hours. I wasn't like working a ton of hours, right? but it was a lot of focus in a short period of time. I now know that I have a real problem with breathing properly through mm. very focused things, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, so fast forward to, we're, we're just feeling the weight of that deadline. We go to an Orange Theory class, which we had just gotten back into Orange Theory and we were really loving it. Because we had taken a break for shingles. Shingles. We paused the it great during shingles. shingles. Also, shout out ordeal. to Orange Theory for being one of the few services, workout services, that you can pause and they don't penalize you for it. Well, you do have to pay a fee. Like $15 yeah. or something. Yeah, but like a lot of gyms are like, oh, no, you got to pay like a full month or whatever. Right, right, blah, right, blah. Right, They're right. really good about it. It's really yeah. nice. So, anyway. And um, I go to this class. I get on the treadmill. We start the class. And I immediately feel this wave like I'm just going to pass out. And it scared me so bad. I grabbed the sides of the treadmill. And I wish you, you'd said I grabbed the sides of the people next to me like <laughs> by their love handles. <laughs> you guys got to burn these off. Otherwise, I'm going to pass out. Thank you for not Happy burning love handles. Thank you for not being skinny bitches. Um, I know. The long story of that is I, in my head, thought to myself, I should get off. I should just go take a break. I should take a lap. But there's this part of me that, again, I'm learning this is an opportunity to learn things about myself. I wanted to push through. And yeah. I wanted to say, no, like, body and brain. You're not going to win this again. I'm just now feeling myself again. This will pass. And I just muscle through the entire workout. And I cried actually during the workout. Like, I think you remember when we were switching from Florida thing and I'm like, I don't feel good. And you were like, go sit outside. And I was like, no, I think I can do this. Did you guys hear how supportive I was in that moment of her not have to push through? But Thank literally you. during that workout, it was like a switch was flipped. Like from that point on until today, as I, we're recording this, I didn't feel like myself. Which is about seven weeks. Yeah. So sometimes that feeling of like, I'm going to pass out goes away. Like it did, you know, a week or like back in December when it happened and it took a week to like take a step back and it was fine, but it just got worse. And like every day after that, um, I think after about two weeks, that was sort of like the rock bottom of it because then the helplessness starts to kick in mm -hmm. and you go, oh, wait, this isn't just going to be a thing where I take a step back and I, you know, watch Netflix for a few days and I take it easy and I'm back to my old self. It was like, oh, this is a new experience and yeah. this is scary and I don't understand what's happening. And some of the physical symptoms that I had were not only feeling like I was going to pass out and like having this lightheadedness, but incredible like light sensitivity. So like it was really hard to like look into the sun. Um, I this is a really hard one to describe, but I'm going to try because, again, I think it's validating if you're somebody who 
Also, I just want to say as a disclaimer, if you are somebody who struggles with anxiety and this is at all making you feel more anxious or it's not helping, like, please Keep turn listening. it off. Keep listening. Oh, yeah. Please no, yeah. don't Give do that to yourself to... Um, because I know that that happened to me a few times. However, if it's making you feel seen and like it is helping you feel not alone, then I hope it's doing that. But um, I felt not connected to my surroundings. So like we would take walks and we would walk down to the ocean that we always look at and I would look out at the ocean and I don't know how to describe this except to say I couldn't like focus on the ocean. I didn't feel sensory wise connected internally to what I was seeing outside and it's a very scary feeling because you just go I don't feel right and then of course what happens is you go through all of the mental gymnastics of like this is weird do I have a brain tumor am I dying is this strange is this normal is this not normal and then so there's this layer of anxiety that then comes on top of what you're experiencing whatever the underlying issues are and you just feel like you're in this cycle that you can't get out of and I mean, a couple of times I came pretty close to panic attacks just from the physical symptoms. And I mean, it was just the scariest thing, like, mm-hmm. you know, and and the struggle. It wasn't just like struggling day after day. It was struggling like hour by hour. Yeah. Yeah. As we were really in the thick of probably the worst of it in the first two weeks, you know, you kind of had this thing, especially when we were going through shingles. It was like. All right, every day is a new day. It's going to be better tomorrow. Like just, but this actually became like hour by hour. Mm-hmm. Like you literally felt like, I mean, you were on the brink of death a certain way. Like it just you felt so bad. Like you mm-hmm. never felt that bad before. And and not to try and make this out to be like as bad as some people deal with other things because I think you can immediately try and be like, oh well, this you know cannot be. It's like sub- subjectively, this is one of the worst things that's ever happened to you in your life. Yeah, and you do play those games where you go like people are struggling with much worse things right. like but but it doesn't help because all you feel is guilt. The experience that you're feeling. Right. Well, and then you I think it's just like you said when when it comes to like even being around the family on Christmas, it's like well, why can't I just feel normal? Right. You know, like why can't I just flip this off and and flip it off in two ways. One, turn it off, two, mm-hmm. flip it off with the middle finger, you know. Yeah. And for somebody like me who, like, has done the work, I've gone to therapy multiple times. I've been going to the same therapist now for over a year. And you start to Dr. feel... Dr. Annie. Dr. Annie, shut up. But you, <laughs> you do start to feel, like, frustrated that you feel like you're putting in the work to... And this is where... This is actually, like, an important turning point for me in, in ch- shifting my perspective through this experience is... I was so scared of the things that I was experiencing that all I wanted was to like get some type of leverage over these symptoms. I was like, tell me what to do. Is it meditating? Is it yoga? Is it going for walks? Is it going to therapy? Like, tell me the thing that's going to solve this problem. And one of the things that Dr. Annie said to me in one of our sessions was like, the thing about anxiety is like, if you believe that it's some part of you your child self or your core self or the, your your true being that's trying to make itself seen and known and heard, which I do believe that, um, then how do you think it feels when you're trying to get leverage over it? Like if you, let's just for, for a second pretend that it's some part of you that's trying to say like, hey, 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 like you're going too fast or you're you're trying to silence this. Can we assign it to a part of your body that like doesn't get much love? Wh- what? Like, like your, your spleen. elbow? No, like your spleen. Oh, your spleen. Like, uh, okay, like sure, sure, sure. your spleen is your anxiety. Okay. It's not actually thing that processes like sugar in, or whatever. But it's internal part of you and like your soul. But Brothers, sure. Yeah. Okay. Your anxiety spleen. Your anxiety spleen is like, hi, um, you haven't been paying a lot of attention to me and I have these needs and I have these things and um, you keep shutting me down to like keep going faster and harder and I'm just trying to get your attention and I'm going to have to like start shouting pretty soon here. If we believe that that's what's happening, like imagine then if that, that other part of you is like, shh. No, no, Mr. Spleen. No, Mr. Spleen. No, Mr. Not right spleen. now. Like, how do we shut that down? How do we shut it down? Yeah. And it's only going to get louder and it's yeah. only going to get more aggressive. And so that helped shift it into a curiosity of like, okay, no longer is it about just trying to like solve this problem. I think two things helped me. Not trying to solve the problem, but instead trying to be curious and wondering what is it trying to tell me. And then... What was the other one I was going to say? Oh, two is like to not be afraid of it. Right. And to just and to just finally make that decision and go, you know what? This isn't going to hurt me. 
Um, there are, you know, and I went on the deep dive of the internet to see what other people's anxiety symptoms were. And a lot of people struggle with the same things. So again, that's why I'm describing them because I think that could be helpful to someone out there. And just, that just put my mind at ease a little bit to say like, okay, if yeah. if we're not going to die, then like, and that, that helped me, especially like at night when I would be so aware of the sensations in my head, the pressure in my head behind my eyes. And I would just sort of do this meditation of like, softening into those sensations instead of trying to like run from them and that helped me a lot um other things that did help me because i wanted to say that as well when it was the worst just distracting myself like Mm -hmm. not sitting there i mean i tried the whole like let's just watch something i couldn't watch things or just kind of veg out in front of the tv i had to go for a short walk or painting actually really did help um coloring i tried like coloring apps which helped just like kind of giving my brain something to do besides focus on how shitty I felt and how scared I was. A little bit of yoga. A little bit of yoga. Um, Actually, I was on the verge of a panic attack and I searched like yoga for anxiety or panic and found a yoga with Adrian video. Adrian. And that little sequence, like I think really helped me come down from a panic attack. It was really hard in the beginning because you're like, this isn't working, but I just trusted the process and that really helped. Um, Another thing... I do want to be honest about is medication. Yep. So when it was the worst, I like part of it and I was really desperate. I remembered that my primary care doctor had prescribed for me basically a medication called um, Ativan, which is lorazepam. And it, it was for flying. That was for flight anxiety. Um, and I had it on this hand. This was during shingles that she prescribed it. Right. Because I was going on a trip. Um And I knew that I had taken it one time before to kind of stave off a panic attack. And I just had it on hand, so I took it. And I will tell you guys, um, don't take medication that is not prescribed for a specific purpose um, because – and I never thought I'd be one of those people that would do that. Like, I'm a very, like, follow the rules person. But you get so desperate. And um, so – as it turns out, that's really a bad thing to do because of the formulation of it. You're not supposed to take it um, every day. And I think you build up like a tolerance to it and stuff. So I knew that that wasn't a long-term solution. It was just kind of getting me through. Um, the But I wanted to say that in that experience, it did help me see like the, the idea of taking a medication for something like anxiety or, or depression in a different way. And I understand why people go that route because – if you can't function, also, if I didn't have a situation where I could take a step back from work or things like that, um, or a supportive partner, like, I don't know what I would have done. But on the flip side of that. Did you see that? I literally reached for it as it was going. You have a gift. All right. Hold on one sec. All right. Our timer did go off, but this is, we're not. We're not going to stick to the timer. We're not bound by time around here because there's a lot to go through. I was going to say the flip side of that is. The flip side of what? Just to remind me. To remind you talking about the medication and i can see why people go that route but on the flip side i was talking to my primary care doctor and her immediate response to what i was experiencing was to put me on a medication for anxiety yeah without without questioning me without asking this was just a phone call too you didn't even go in to see her a phone call my doctor immediately prescribed me this medication a different Um, a different medication not that man a different one a more long-term medication didn't ask me like what else I had done. Um, didn't ask me what else was going on. Um, I mean, I guess in her defense, I did come to her with the idea that this was anxiety induced. But if like I expected her to say, come on in, we'll do some other tests or we'll talk and figure out what the best solution is. And she just immediately prescribed the medication. And we could go down a whole diatribe of this. But I do want to point out that I, I think it's a really important lesson. Not that we want this whole episode to be about lessons and things, but I do think it's very helpful for people who might be experiencing some of this is to just have a little bit of empathy for a primary care doctor that they just don't know what they're doing. <laughs> When it comes to brain stuff, when it comes to nutrition stuff, when it comes to specialized things. Holistic things. Holistic things. They don't know what they're doing. Right. And I think that some people may have an incredibly good primary care doctor who cares about those things, has invested time in those things, and maybe they know those things. But from our experience, none of them do. So it's really important to take it upon yourself to go, well, this doctor just prescribed me this medicine, and I guess that's what I'm going to have to take. And to go, no, you know what? This is that whole, like, get a second opinion thing. Like, but let's get a specific second opinion from someone who deals with this actual thing. And my whole thing is, like, 
I don't, I don't judge anyone for taking medication or going that route. It's just, you have to be your own health advocate and do that thought, like you have to do it thoughtfully and mindfully knowing that there are these side effects, knowing that, um, you know, that it's essentially changing your brain chemistry. And so that was just for me, that wasn't, I needed to do more before I went down that route. Um, Can I just make one more point? What? I just think it's really important if you are an American and you go through the American healthcare system, that entire system is propped up by big pharma. So a doctor is incentivized to prescribe a pill. They are not incentivized to solve a problem without a prescription. That's why whenever you go to the doctor, you're almost always prescribed something. I just bring this up because I think it's really important. You're, that's no. Is that, is that a soapbox? I just but no, like, but I think it. I think it is really an important thing that that people hear from real people and normal people that these are not bad people who are working as doctors, but they are incentivized to push something across the counter to you for you to take and they get money for that. And it is not their, their necessarily their incentivization to help you and solve your problem by actually figuring out what the root of it is and solving it that way. And so yeah. I think it then, and this is for me where I just get, I get really stubborn and I get really stuck in this where I just go, okay, we have to be like the advocates for our own bodies and we have to go, okay, what do we need? I need to go to a specialist. I need to go to someone who does this and I have to spend the money to do that, unfortunately, but I don't want to just take pills. I don't just want to do this. And again, not that there's anything wrong with pills. I just think you should give yourself the chance to go to someone who specializes in a thing totally. before just taking a pill and, yeah, and, and getting a, stuck and in a, a cycle. That's all. And a big part of it for me was talking to people who had been on medication right. and hearing what their experience had been. And while it was helpful, the, you know, the med- getting while off the of the medication it, was helpful. The, while the medication was helpful, getting off of the medication was incredibly difficult. And there were side effects and all these different things. And so um, I wanted to leave that option on the table, but I wanted to go down every other route possible. So, And I will say, again, sorry, well, I'm not trying to like steamroll here um as we discussed when the doctor prescribed medicine i did say hey you know like i think we should talk to another doctor however if taking the medication is going to help you now yeah i'm okay like let's do that because you were in so much pain and and uncomfortability and at that point i think i we were just both ready for you to feel any sense of comfort at all right and so it's okay. Maybe if you're at a place where you just feel so absolutely terrible that anything to help you get out of that spiral, because that's what you yeah. did with the first medication, yeah. is that we finally just were like, let's just get you some, any relief. Yeah. 1% better is anything better right now yeah. than what you have. Also, at the time, um, somebody else had uh, given us the tip of trying CBD. Right. And so, again, we like, actually, we're we not, actually got a lot of people saying CBD. Yeah. We're not doctors. So, like, disclaimer, definitely do your research and check with your doctor before you take anything and ingest anything. But, um, I, I discovered that for me and for my body, um, taking this particular CBD capsule at, a, I had to like go a couple days to get my dosage. Right. But, um, you know, 20 milligrams of that for me and, and my, and for my body. I think it's worth sharing because if someone's listening to this and they're like, Oh my God, like this sounds like something I want to try, but I have no clue. And I've been on the catacombs of CBD on the internet. What is a good one? What is it? Um, I think the brand is called Sagely Naturals. Okay, just to give someone that they can look it up and they can look yeah. at it. It so has definitely them. helped you, which yeah. is great. Yeah, and so um, two purposes. I found that about like two capsules of it kind of was the equivalent of one Ativan. So that's an unsafe med- medication to take long term, but CBD is natural. And so I felt okay taking that as like to kind of settle me down. And like I said, it allowed me to peel off that top layer of anxiety so that I could ask myself and get curious about the underlying issues that were happening. Right. Because the problem is when you when it's when you're in a spiral, like you were saying, you can't even you don't even want to go look for another doctor. You don't want to get a second opinion. You, You can't think. Yeah. You can't like every hour, like I was saying, is torture. You feel like you are trapped inside of your own mind and you can't think and you can't do anything. And so anything to like take that top layer off um, is helpful. So that worked for me. Again, everybody is different. Um, And it also really helped us sleep. So I would take two of those before bed as well. And um, with some sleepy time tea, they made you so sleepy. Jason and I have this running joke that I will share with everyone that because the nighttime had become so anxiety inducing for me um, and I had a trouble sleeping, we decided that we needed to do some type of placebo ritual yeah. Yeah. in order to get me like in the frame of mind to be tired. And so we would make chamomile tea and we would have this like running joke that it was like 
it would just the tea was so strong that it would make you, as you so even sleepy. as you started brewing even it. if you started like brewing i was starting it, you out the water i'm like oh you can just sleep yeah you have to do it in the voice yeah you and then like, you're like kind of close as you bet oh no, i'm getting I'm just, so sleepy oh, my eyes are so heavy i'm, I'm just so sleepy. sleepy and then you'd be sitting and like oh i think i need to go to bed <laughs> <laughs> so we did that and for maybe about- it worked i don't know i like i think the the interesting thing about all the things we've talked about meditation yoga cbd sleepy time tea actual like prescribed medication walks any of those things distractions coloring books like all that just try it all try it all and and see I, how you feel and just and maybe you just need to have it all at your disposal and that was what i felt like my job was is yeah. that when you went into these spirals it wasn't I, was, I i didn't go like hey do you want to do this 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 or this yeah. like hey do you want to try and do a meditation right now or well, or can whatever can i take a second and just Toot your horn for a little oh, second. Oh, I thought you were going to say something mean. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> now that's also that sounded dirty. Can I toot your horn for a second? Oh wow! Um, Only if it's with some soupy tea. Some soupy tea. <laughs> Don't fall asleep. Um, <laughs> what I wanted to tell everybody is that, and we can shift this into a conversation too about how what it, what the experience was like on your end, because I think a lot of people that struggle with this, there's sometimes a partner involved, you know, a spouse who maybe gets it, maybe doesn't get it. Um, this time around, I feel like you were incredible because in the first couple of weeks when it was the hardest, you gave me, you just gave me space and you just said, I will take every single thing off your plate that I possibly can. Are you crying? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I had <laughs> to you wipe. you see this like gentle to, press that I just did? Oh. Here's what happened inside. What? I had to wipe my eye because I think my tear duct was like, was like, whoa, hey, what's going on? I, Someone wake me up. I'm, I, what, I've been asleep for 13 years. <laughs> I picture your emotions being like, uh, like we're wake up, wake up, and then it just like coughing out dust. Like yeah, your but dust also, like, <laughs> but like if you've seen the the movie uh, Inside Out, there's like some security guards that are like yeah. blocking all the emotional people, yeah. and they're like, whoa, 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 hold on, hold on, hold on, <laughs> we haven't used this space in a long time, <laughs> and the tear duct is like, oh, what's going on? Okay, <laughs> so that's just why so like, we're on I the same think page. just wanted to recap why my eye itched yeah. at that moment. Okay. It's not a tear; it's just a little. Itchy. It's just a lot of stuff. It's going the coughing up dust. <laughs> <laughs> all right okay now that we got that cleared up um no but like can't have a normal conversation not anything around here <gasps> you were so good at just giving me space and not doing the like hey do you want to do a coloring book or do you want to go for a walk or whatever in those first weeks where it was so hard because we've had conversations in, in the past where sometimes it, if you're a partner and you're suggesting those things you're doing it out of love because you want to help the person get better but Sometimes what can happen is the person who's experiencing that can then start to feel guilty that they're not doing enough to get themselves out of this situation or out of this spiral. And so it can feel like more guilt and more shame. And so in those first couple of weeks, you didn't suggest anything. And you just said, take time, figure it out, you know, whatever you need to do. And then once you realized that I was sort of getting a little bit better or that, you know, it was incremental then that's when you were such an advocate for like hey do you want to go for a walk or what do you what do you want to do but you always let me be in the driver's seat of what what do i need and i appreciated that so much because for those first couple of weeks it really did let the guilt the guilt wasn't as bad as it's been in the past yeah and it's just it's hard to be a caretaker i mean i yeah. said that during the shingles um episode of 2018 is that it's just it's difficult. It's difficult to be the person who's watching your loved one, your friend, you know, family member when they're sick, when they're injured, when they can't be their normal self and you know them a certain way and you expect them to be a certain way and every day they don't wake up that way. It's really difficult. And mm-hmm. you want like for me, I'm a fixer. So yeah. I'm very practically minded. I'm I very much want to fix things. I don't want to let things sit or simmer or you whatever. You also hate being out of control. Hate being out of control. It's my least favorite thing. And so at all times throughout the shingles thing, it was like, what can I do? And you just, I finally realized, oh, I can't actually control any of this. Like there's nothing that I'm going to do that is going to fix this virus that is inside you. So I just have to step back and go, okay, I'm just going to be here. And I'm like you said, I'm going to allow for space. And so when you were really kind of crippled with anxiety at the beginning of this year, I just sat back and I was like, okay, I can't fix this. This is your spleen. Your anxiety spleen is on fire. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just going to go, I'm here for you. If like, I'll make all your meals. I'll, you know, pay all the bills. I already do all that, but you know, I'll just do, I'll do all the things that need to be done. And I'll just ask you every day, as many times as I can throughout the day, not in a guilt driven way whatsoever. Like, can I do anything to help you? Is there anything I can do? But isn't it hard? Like, 
not just emotionally seeing somebody that you love and you can't help them, but also just the very real logistical challenge of putting the entire burden of a household on your shoulders. Totally. But it doesn't, it doesn't do any good to even think about it. Yeah. Like for me, and I think that's just where some people are different. Some people like you mentioned this the other day and I think Dr. Annie had a phrase for it of like the way that I think, what was it? It's like, I can just, I can just plow through anything no matter what's going on. Like I was that Dr. Jane saying brick, brick brain. No, 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 no. It was Dr. Annie said something. You mentioned it, but it was like, for me, like no matter what's happening, I can still focus on tasks and get them done. Mm -hmm. Like the outside influences aren't going to slow me down, even if it's a lot of really tough things. Now, eventually it will add up and it will cause some type of issue. There's Mm -hmm. no doubt, but I do have the ability to like steamroll through stuff. So Mm -hmm. yeah, it, it's absolutely difficult. Yeah. It's a lot more time on my hands. You know, we're in a weird place with our business where we have not reached the goal that we've wanted. Uh, things aren't perfect. We're still in kind of some experimentation phases, which we like, but it's a lot harder when there's, you know, only one person kind of managing all those things. Yeah. And and so, yeah, but I think for me and I think for anybody listeners who might be on the caretaker side, it's just important for you to go, this is temporary. Mm-hmm. Like, as much as you have to say every hour of every day, this is going to get better and I have to think about that. You, As a caretaker, you have to do the same thing. Mm-hmm. This is not going to be the forever new normal. And I just have to be honest with myself that this is a short amount of time when I'm taking on more things. And I also tried to remove some things. So mm-hmm. uh, I removed two projects from my plate during this time as well. Mm-hmm. And I just tried to slim down the amount of hours that I'm spending doing stuff that's not really that important mm-hmm. so that I can focus on stuff and, and I can move on. Yeah, for sure. And an important realization for me that I actually had last night when we were at dinner, which I didn't tell you about, but you said last night, you said, I'm tired. I'm just tired. And my reaction as the person who has the anxiety, my first like gut response was to be guilt, to feel guilty and to feel wo- which I wanted you to obviously, of course. Yeah. and to feel wounded and to go, you're tired. Well, what about me? I'm t- like, I'm in this mental torture every day. But what I realized is it doesn't help you for me to, to take that from you. Like you're justified in your feeling of being tired and in, in, in your exhaustion. And I don't have to react to your tiredness by feeling guilty or making it about me. Right. And I don't need to, I don't even need to have it say anything about me right. because it just is what it is. And so I'm not going to rob you of your valid feelings. I'm just going to say, I know you're tired. This sucks. Yeah. Just the way that I would want you to say, I know you're tired. This sucks. Well, and it, it's come up for us in the past week. This is just some real talk, real honest, real talk here of just uh, like I've felt myself being um what's the easiest way to describe this normally when we're in a conversation and something is out of alignment i can very quickly process what to do how to how to change fix or offer up a solution for whatever that's just the way that i'm wired and it may not always be the right thing but i can very quickly do it this past week i've felt myself being a lot slower at that Mm -hmm. and i've just thought about it and i'm like well if i actually think about it literally since august I have not gotten a good night's sleep because mm-hmm. our dog Plaxico is an asshole and he wakes up at 4.30 every morning and He's wants the to go out. He's little asshole, though. And, and I have a really hard time falling back to sleep. So before you got shingles, your job for our household was to take Plax out because you can take him out, feed him. He just wants to go back to sleep after that. Right. You fall back asleep easily. Yep. I just don't. Right. So I started thinking about that. I was like, wow, well, I really haven't had a good night's sleep in a long time. And that's not a criticism of you and you shouldn't feel any guilt about that. But I just wanted you to know... And what I said to you the other day was, I don't want these feelings to fester. And I don't want for me to not explain to you why maybe things are coming up differently or maybe I'm not having like the clarity of thought of what I normally do. Just to be honest with you, like I'm just tired and I know that I'm it's going to get better and we're going to be in a better place and it's going to work itself out. But if I didn't tell you that, I would hold on to it. And then I think resentment would start. And, I and think, you and I are always on the lookout for resentment because yeah. I think that that is the quickest way to drive a wedge through a relationship, yep. whether it's a marriage or any other relationship. Like the second that you start to have this like keeping score resentment mentality, it's never good. So yeah. you and I are always like really on the lookout for that. Um, I do want to say, too, yeah. I mean, I think it's an interesting topic just to discuss is that there's no there's no secret that I have not had thoughts of like. Well, you know, these past six months, like 
I've done everything, you know, once you're healthy, you're going to start doing all the things. Absolutely. I've thought that <laughs> for sure. And I just want to be honest that I think from the other side, like where you're kind of giving people the permission to go like, here are your thoughts. It's okay to have these thoughts. I think from the other side, you're going to have those thoughts. Right. And the key <laughs> is that you realize like zoom the timeline out a little bit. Yeah. So look at the timeline of your relationship and understand that like, hey, this is like a just a small chunk right. when you've had to, you know, take on more, you know, not sleep as well, do whatever. That is not the extrapolation of the entire relationship. Yeah. And understand, again, like it's going to get better. And then just go like, okay, I had those thoughts. I let them come about. But you don't get any more time. Yeah. That's it. It's it's like dealing with fear. It's like dealing with self-doubt. It's dealing with positive. It's like you acknowledge that they exist. You acknowledge that they happen. And then you go, okay, but like you're not going to control the situation. Mm -hmm. And we're not going to let you do anything here because that's only going to bring about a lot more problems moving mm -hmm. forward. And so for me, I just have continued to tell myself, like, this is not forever. Yeah. This is not that bad. Like, sure, I'm a little bit tired here and there, but only in comparison to the fact that, like, we've optimized our lives so much mm -hmm. that I'm just used to feeling good all the time. It's true. So it's just a very different kind of comparison as well. I think that's all wonderful and great that you said that. Um, <laughs> but no, 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 I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm I just kidding. wanted I just to, I'm funny. cognizant of the time. So I wanted to, there are a couple more things I wanted to talk about. I want to talk about how this affects all of our, our work. And you talked about that a little bit, but, um, an important thing that I want people to know is as much as it sucked, um, you and I made the decision to push back our deadline for yeah. launching our program. And that really pained me. But I think you can see in the story that I told you of how all these things, all these dominoes have led to this situation. I look back and I go, you know, if I had just had the balls to say to to honestly like quit a couple more things or to go back on a commitment as much as it would have sucked to let that person down. The, the thing that I am doing is prolonging this inevitability, which is that I'm letting myself down yeah. and I'm letting us down. And so – um. You know, I just we had to take a good hard look at ourselves and go, yeah, it sucks to tell these because we had just launched it yeah. and said, OK, great. Like we had just opened the, the membership and and everyone was excited and we had new members and we had to email them and say, hey, actually, we're pushing this back till March. Now, a great and amazing thing about attracting a community based on shared values and not based on some promise that you're, you know, going to make them a ton of money is that the majority of everybody was so gracious and said, Caroline, take care of yourself. Um, another really interesting thing that happened that you can probably speak to more is how many messages we got back of people saying, I deal with anxiety. My husband deals with crippling anxiety. Yeah. I've dealt with anxiety for years. Like I'm talking like an exorbitant amount of messages. Oh yeah. All right. Let's, let's pull it. Come on right in here. Okay. Thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you to our amazing community of Wandering Gameplay members. Yeah. I want to like look you in the eye as much as I possibly can. So if you're listening to this, I'm literally staring into my close-up camera to say thank you so much. The response to the email that we sent saying we have to push this back by a month and a week or two was overwhelmingly positive. Um, I don't think we had a single person cancel their membership in that moment, which is what we feared would happen. Yep. Um, we got, I think I remember we got 74 replies. We have 400 ish members. Um, that's a lot of people to reply. That's not just people opening. That's people who literally wrote back. And so many of them, number one said what you just said, that they've dealt with anxiety in some way or their friends or family. That's crazy. That that's come up a lot, but everything else in their messages was like, Tell Caroline, like, she can take all the time she needs. Uh, care so much about you guys taking care of your health. Like, thank you for being so honest about this and not just pushing through. It was amazing to read those messages. Like, I still have them saved. I tagged them all so that you could go through them at some point because you haven't read them all. I just, I started, I would ask Caroline, like, do you want to read the thoughtful message that just came through now? And I would read, like, these little snippets. And I'd yeah. be like, oh, like, you know, this person said this. And it's Again, we are not in a place where we have figured our business out. We are making all the money we want to make and everything is working perfectly. So to have to push back a deadline, to have to tell people we can't deliver on the thing, that sucks for us because we are not deadline pushers. Right. We are deadline meters. Yeah. Um, and I think for us to be able to do that, it showed a lot of people, hey, these crazy zooks that crank out a lot of work and do a lot of things, they're human as well. Mm -hmm. And that they run into the same shit that I'm running into in my life and in my business. And for those of you who aren't even Wandering Gameplay members, I hope that just hearing this makes you feel a little breath of relief that like, oh, okay, like it, it's all right that things don't always work out. I don't always meet every deadline. And that sometimes you have to say this, it's too much. 
And we have to push it back. Yeah. And again, looking for the silver linings in playbook in a situation like this, which I can do now because I'm a little bit a little bit removed from it. It's okay if you can't see the silver lining and you're in the thick of it. But one of the things that it does for you is it starts to kind of shuffle everything into priority. Right. So you just go like, I feel like death right now. And so not meeting a deadline is actually not that important in the grand scheme of things. Self-imposed deadline. Compared to how bad I feel. Yeah. And, um, and it also just really, really made me realize how many times we do this to ourselves. We love to produce at a high level. We love to produce a lot of things. We just get excited about creating things. This stupid show gets like 200 views <laughs> and 500 downloads. And we have a friggin' three camera setup, two mics. We pay an editor. It's a studio in our friend's home. We invest a shitload of time and effort into this. And it's because we care so much about the quality of things that we put out. We just care about it. And so, but I think the issue is that sometimes we get into this situation where we set like a deadline for ourselves or something. And we do that because we know that we we like constraints and we like to create a container for us to create. Um, what it's taught me is that I need to reevaluate how I the expectation that I put on us and myself specifically of what I need to create in what period of time. I think it also uh, is important to talk about like, what do you actually need to be doing for our business? Right. Like, right. And that goes back to the priorities conversation right. is it starts to allow those things to kind of like, is it important that we post every day on Instagram? No. Is it important? You just start to go, okay, well, let's actually go through those things. Is it important that you are in our Slack community? I think because there's two of us, I don't think I know that because there's two of us, the answer is no, you don't need to show up in the Slack community for everyone to feel like you're a part of the membership. I'm there. I relay messages. I bring updates and, and those things. And that's fine. And and maybe you'll come back around. Maybe you won't. It doesn't matter. Email. Like there's this thing in, in our entrepreneurial space. And, and I think in everyone's lives, like we feel like we owe it to people who email us to reply. That email did not exist before you got it. Mm -hmm. Yet when it shows up, you feel some type of onus that you have to reply. And we finally had the conversation where it was like, just shut down email. Like, I know that you carry all this guilt for these people who send you these amazingly thoughtful emails and you don't have the ability to get back to them because you're not feeling good. Like, let's just turn off email for a while. Well, for now, yeah. I mean, and it's not a forever thing. Exactly. It's, yeah, it's, it's just, just it's being honest about where you are and what you need as a person. And, you know, I'd be lying if I said there wasn't a part of me that feels so feels guilty right now that I can't be more present for my friends who are going through hard things or can't be more present for my family or can't be more present for all these things. But I'm in this space right now where I just I have to like heal. Yeah. You know what I mean? And and I it's not something that people something that people can see from the outside looking in, but it's as if, you know, I had some type of injury and I would just need to like get back on my feet. That's yeah. how I feel. Yeah. And so you know, again, it's funny because listing out the whole like sort of deluge of things that happen leading up to this is you and I talk about this all the time. Like all of these things are stacked on top of each other and it's not going to be something that heals itself overnight. Right. It's going to take time and it's probably going to take more time than I even want to yep. think that it'll take. Um, but, you know, we have been just treading very lightly. We're back in the studio recording like I'm and we're okay doing, right now. We were doing two to three episodes in a batch, and we're going to do one. Yep. And we're going to be done. And we've been recording the new program so that we can get it up and running. And we've been doing one short video every day. Yep. And we, yeah, so it's it's been really interesting to go, okay, we have this Build Without Burnout program. You did a lot of work up front. That, you know, I think there were like 300 slides that you had already designed. You'd come up with the whole curriculum. We'd gone over all this stuff together. Um, you know, just so much work had already been done up front. And so all that was really left was to record each lesson as a keynote with audio recorded over top of it, a voiceover of us, and then do little intro videos to each section of it. Mm -hmm. And there's six, six main sections. Um, and so what we decided is like, okay, instead of that being an overwhelming task, it's one lesson, one video per day. So we would try and record one video and they're like five to 10 minutes long. Right. And then you try and work on one lesson per day. Yeah. And if that doesn't happen, so what? Doesn't matter. But that at least becomes the bite-sized goal that we're trying to hit. And guys, as it turns out, that's an incredibly sustainable and effective way to build something. <laughs> yeah. I've never known this before. Um, it's. I look forward to recording that every day now because it's not overwhelming and I don't feel like it's going to be tiring. It just is like, oh, I can concentrate on this one thing. So 
I think it has finally changed the way that we uh, that we look at work. I hope my biggest fear at this point is that I don't want to fall back into old patterns and get myself right back here again. Um, however, going through something really hard and kind of emerging on the other side of it, it proves to you that you can get through a lot of really tough things in life. And, you know, I, I don't know. I'm really just proud of myself for being able to get through that hard time and doing what I had to do to emerge out of it, you know? All right. So we just had to do another set of clips. So if there's an awkward. Sorry, this is a long episode. Yeah. Uh, there's just a lot to unpack here. Yeah. Um, okay. So I think the one thing that we didn't touch on that we want to touch on here, because I went on my soapbox about uh, primary care doctors, yeah. is that you did find through a bunch of research um, a thing that is helping. And we've now had three appointments with this yeah, new doctor. Yeah, so it wasn't actually research. It was Dr. Annie recommended. <laughs> Dr. Annie. I know. Man, she's coming in the clutch. She's the best. So I have had... Um, the same therapist for a year now and she's incredible and she does a type of uh, therapy called EMDR and if you're interested in therapy I would just do some research on what that is and that is it's really different than EDM therapy it's different than EDM where yeah. you just like if you're just hooked on yeah. EDM yeah. Um, but it has been really incredible for me to learn more about myself and to kind of I mean what it really does is like neurologically heal some of your like past childhood traumas and things like that that are still kind of stuck um i'm not gonna get into it anyway because i would use all the wrong terms anyway but when it was really bad uh, one thing that she recommended was this type of treatment called neurofeedback and i had never heard of that before and so i did a bunch of research and again not to get too far into it but what it basically does is it first of all there are methods of um recording the brain waves that you have that um and it's fairly standard it's an eeg it's a it's an ecg i think is what it's called oh boy i know ekg is the heart one anyway it's the thing that measures your brain waves and what it does is you first kind of go in and it, you measure like a baseline of like where all you your brain waves map. at you do a map and then using different types of methodologies of treatment um they do different exercises and they basically train your brain in order to produce um, a better, like a more normal set of brainwaves, I guess is the best way to describe that. Yep. Um, so for example, I'll just give my personal example. When we went in and we did the first brain map, you can see that in my, this area of my brain. So you're pointing to the top left area above your left eye. Thank you. For everyone who can't see. The amplitude of the the brain waves are like way out of whack. It's like lit up on the it, map. Literally what she said was it looks like there was blunt force trauma to that part of your brain. That's how like crazy out of whack it is. And so what that does is. And there wasn't just to be clear. I have not (laughs) laid a hand on Caroline. And the way that she kind of described it to me is like the underlying area of your brain is always thinking when there are, you know, things around you like, oh, this is an emergency. This is an emergency. This is like there's a lion chasing me or whatever. And your cerebral cortex, the thing that kind of lays on top of it is the barrier that allows it to say like, no, 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 like this is not a real threat or it kind of allows you to filter out what is a real emergency and what is not she called it a hairnet a hairnet and so she said you got a hole in your hairnet because yeah. basically you can see that the the waves are out of whack in that one section and what that does is it's just telling my nervous system that there's an emergency all the time um i guess that's the best way that i can describe it not being a phd like my doctor is um yeah. And so through a series of sessions, also a ton of breathing exercises, this is also a very helpful thing that I want to share in case you too have anxiety symptoms like the lightheadedness and the dizziness and things like that. Um, We discovered that I probably had this thing called or have this thing called compensatory hyperventilation. No, probably. Do. Yeah. (laughs) And um, again, not with getting too technical with it, but like the balance of carbon dioxide to oxygen is off. And so there can't be the exchange that happens inside your body to give you your blood cells oxygen. And so basically my brain was being, my blood cells actually were being deprived of oxygen, which gives you that feeling of being lightheaded or um, like you're going to pass out. And so um, she gave me some breathing techniques in order to get that balance back into a normal range. And, and that helped tremendously. So after the very first meeting that we had with her, Slowly but surely, the dizziness symptoms have been going away, which is tremendous. So um, I would, if you're somebody who's dealing with dizziness right now, I would Google compensatory hyperventilation and see if that leads you down a path of relief. Um, And so we're going to continue to go to her. And 
every week and try and um, do this neurofeedback exercise and see if we can heal that part of my brain um, to a degree where it can it can function in a better way so that it's not making me feel like a lion is chasing me at all yeah. times. And I really think this is important to bring up because it if I remember how long it took you to call her and then, you know, there's some skepticism, I guess, because you're just like, what is this? Like, you know, yeah. I've never heard of this. There's not a lot of things I can find on, you know, whatever. And we go in and I will say this is to me the most important thing. As you're talking to her, she's like, oh, yeah, this is the compensatory blah, 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 blah thing with the breathing. And and you're describing this. And she's like, yeah, that's anxiety. Like you. you and then she did the brain. And she's like, it's right here. And we're asking all these questions. And by the end of that first meeting, what did we have when we left? Hope. Hope. Yeah. And that to me is as good as any pill that you can be prescribed. Yeah. Because that flipped a switch for me where I went hallelujah, we know what this is. Yeah. And it's no longer just like, I think it's this. It might be this. Is it a brain tumor? I don't know what it is. All these questions were floating around. And you had this person who specialized in this thing and went, no, this is what it is. I've seen this before. I've treated this before. I don't know how long it's going to take. That's an impossibility for me to answer. But we know what we need to do. And every week that we've gone, you've gotten better. Yeah. And that you felt better. And yesterday, as of recording this, or day before yesterday, you felt the best you felt. Mm -hmm since the beginning of this year mm -hmm. and that's a huge win and i think so much of that is finding this doctor understanding that there is a path forward that can fix this to whatever degree that means because it may not be a forever fix it may just be a hey this is something you're going to deal with and th here's how you deal with it and that's important yeah it's also important for me to say that i don't think that it's a substitute for the work that i do with dr annie and the therapy totally. yeah because in my the way that i believe that it's working is like there's a part of my nervous system that is injured and dr jane the neurofeedback we, have, we, got, a lot of doctors. we got a lot of doctors doctor is sort of helping to heal that so that my nervous system can process inputs properly however you know i think that the therapy and the underlying kind of um issues that have just come about throughout my life and the ways that i operate in certain things in and the way just, that I deal with different stressors yeah, and just who you are based on your DNA and who I am based on just being a very a highly sensitive person you know there's no match for doing that work and learning about myself and getting curious about what the underlying anxiety is supposed to be showing me about what I need and who I am so I think they go hand in hand and I'm just glad that I that we found something that seems to be working yeah and again I just if you can find hope in whatever it is that you might be dealing with, whether it's anxiety or something else or whatever, just try and search that thing. Give yourself permission to find a specialist or whatever or talk to somebody or, you know, any of those things. I can just say that hope has just been a huge thing for us. Yeah. So. And you can get through anything like yeah. you can. And yeah. it does get better even if it doesn't feel like it. Even if seven weeks ago you couldn't get out of bed because yeah. you just felt like you had crippling anxiety that was sitting on top of your head. Yeah. And the last thing that I just want to say is I, for people who don't experience anxiety, I think there's a misconception that it's just all in your head and that, oh, well, why can't you just like be more calm? Why can't right. you just meditate more or whatever? And it's really, really important to me that people know that this is a very physical thing that happens to people and, and it's crippling and it's torturous at times. And, you know, if there's somebody in your life that struggles with it, to just have compassion for them because they're they're trying. I can guarantee you they're right. trying and I can guarantee you that they don't want to feel this way either. And even if they look okay on the outside and you wonder why they can't get out of bed or why they can't work or why they can't take care of their kids, like I don't know what those things are. Just have some compassion for them because they want to do all those things too and, you know, their brain and isn't allowing them. Yeah. Uh, all right. Normally, we would finish with a Wagug Defee. But you think we ran long? Uh, I just think that this episode in itself is not one that I want to end on like, oh, let's throw some silly humor at it. Like, I think it's... Whoa. Yeah. Wow. I, I got this... Way to the, read the room. The tear duct security guards are like, <laughs> well, we're not going to let anybody through, but like, just, we acknowledge. <laughs> we acknowledge that you're all here. Um, so yeah, I just think it's, it's worth letting this episode kind of be as it is. And I have no clue if anyone's going to have listened this far, but I'm hopeful that if anybody's going through something similar, that this has given them a little spark of, of hope for themselves, as I mentioned, or um, it's just, you know, something where it becomes a point of relatability that people see, oh, 
you know, these internet entrepreneurs who have these nicely polished websites and carefully crafted copy and, you know, these sales tactics that I, you know, I'm en envious of or whatever. Oh, they're also real people who get sick and can't get their work done too. True. And that this is something that we just thoroughly believe in sharing because it's life. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people would dust stuff like this under the rug and they would just show a whole bunch of polished things. And then, you know, you'd hear about this years down the road. That's not who we are. And I think being honest about this stuff is just important and it's something that really matters to us. Absolutely. And I didn't want to just show up today and do like a regular episode. No, I, this I, is the most relevant honestly, thing we're dealing with. I felt a little bit guilty publishing the past six episodes that yeah. we had that where you were feeling fine and not having a disclaimer on them. But there was also just it was like, well, what was the other choice? Right. You know, like I wasn't just going to pop in here by myself. That would be weird. Who, Plus, who would sit here? That's good stuff in there. That's great stuff. That's great stuff. Yeah. Especially the parts when I said stuff. I would say also when I said stuff, it was pretty great also. 50-50. 41-59. Math. Wow. <laughs> what happened there? Uh, all right, everybody. Thanks for watching this episode. We appreciate you, especially the Wandering Infinity members who supported Caroline through your kindness. And uh, just we're really grateful for you. You guys are amazing. I'm going to be back to normal before you know it. Then Better what? than normal. Then what? Then Super we're gonna take. Then we're going to take it easy. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I'm just moving to Mexico. Oh, interesting. Okay. We'll see how that goes. <laughs>